Uh, well, good evening. Uh, welcome to UBC. It is a joy to be able to gather together with you in person. Uh, I have just been looking forward to this all week. And so um, I know you guys don't have bulletins in front of you, but I want to be able to go over some announcements together with you just briefly here before we start our time of musical worship. Can you turn me up just a little bit, Sam? Thank you. Well, uh, if you're new to UBC, it can be kind of tough to connect to visitors right now. And so to help answer some questions, make some connections with those who are new, we've updated our website with a page that's called I'm New Here. And so if you go to our website at universitybible.org and you click on the, the, the part that says I'm New Here, you can get some answers or some commonly asked questions. Uh, you can find out ways that you can get involved or to get in contact with one of the pastoral staff. Uh, also, um, Dan mentioned it last week, but we do have church softball that's going to be coming up here in June. So it uh, will be taking place this year. Uh, Mike Tensel is the guy who's uh, he's running with that. Um, so if you are interested in being a part of the UBC co-ed softball team, then go ahead and get a hold of of Mike Tensel, um, and if you want to, uh, if you want to grab his number, if you get onto our website and you go to the worship packet, so if you go watch Sunday service or watch the services, you can you can access the worship packet that's there, and his number will be in there. Or if you have a directory, you can look him up in the UBC directory as well. Um, we have a a number of ways that we're trying to kind of keep in touch with the body to. Uh, put out updates, email through the website, through Facebook, uh, and automatic phone calls. And so if you would like to sign up for emails, to receive emails, to be better updated, uh, or you would like to get uh, prayer chain requests, um, what's going on in the body, uh, different prayer requests, how to be able to pray for those folks here at UBC. You can, uh, you can call the office here, talk to our secretary, talk to one of us. Uh, we can sign you up for that, or you can email uh, the secretary. Uh, the, her, the email address is in the directory and on that worship packet as well. Uh, last announcement here. Many of you guys may be wondering about the Vacation Bible School uh, this year with COVID-19. Um, because VBS is a larger gathering together of children and adults, we're not going to be having VBS this year. Uh, in order to safely and effectively reach the children, though, in our community uh, this summer here for Christ, we are looking to increase the number of five-day clubs held this summer in Pocatello and in Chubbuck. So compared to VBS, five-day clubs are, are typically smaller, and they're also held outdoors. Uh, we have enough t trained volunteers right now to hold two clubs, but because they're smaller than VBS, uh, we need additional volunteers to really make those clubs happen. And so there are many of you uh, who maybe helped out this last year in serving with VBS, and there's just a number of ways that you can get involved and help out with the five-day clubs. Uh, but the greatest need, and this is what I'd really like to plug, is that uh, we have a need for more trained teachers. Uh, so there's a two-day teacher training seminar that's going to be going on held here in Pocatello on June 3rd and 4th. If you're interested in being a part of this, we would love to have you. Uh, the only requirement is to be 14 years old and, and older uh, to be a believer. Um, and um, that's, that's the requirements there for teaching a, a five-day club. But if you're interested, please get a hold of myself or Susan Ganstrom. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, with that, why don't you go ahead and stand, and we're going to have the worship team uh, come on up here, and we'll get started with musical worship. I love this first song, Come Thou Fount. It was, um, it was written in 1758 by a, a man named Robert Robinson at the age of 22 years old. And when Robinson, when he was eight years old, he, he lost his father. He became angry. He became bitter. And he went on to rebel in his teenage years. Uh, but God used the, the preaching of uh, George Whitfield to, uh, to penetrate Robinson's heart with the gospel. And then he later went into ministry and then wrote this song, 
Come Thou Fount. And so in this song, he writes about something that's very familiar to each one of us. And I think that's a heart that is prone to wander at times and to leave the God that he loves. And this is also, though, coupled in this song with a confidence that the grace that saves the sinner is also the same grace that will preserve him and to lead him safely home to be face with face with the Lord Jesus Christ and to be freed from sin. So we have such a great hope because we have such a a great God who is a loving and gracious God. So let's, let's sing together, Come Thou Fountain. Thank you. 
next song is really a pray or a prayer excuse me may this song really be our prayer as we move into the preaching of the word that God would show us Christ that he would plant his word down deep deep in us and cause it to bear lasting fruit in our lives for his glory
Go and grab a seat. Good to see your faces here. So you're looking around maybe and thinking, man, like we really getting the social distancing down. Like it's, it's, it's kind of sparse. And, and so we, uh, you know, we're continuing to monitor are the three services necessary. We're, we're kind of right on the line with whether we, you know, could meet all the social distancing stuff with two services or three. And so basically the plan we came up with, just so you know, is to start with three services and to do that for three weeks. And so next week would be the third week on that. And then evaluate and see. We'll have a better sense by then how many people are going to watch from home, how many are wanting to come in. Uh, and so next week and our plan would still be to have this Saturday night service. Uh, and then we'll evaluate after that and, and, and see. We may go to just, just the two services on Sunday morning. We'll, we'll see um, uh, what the needs are there. Okay, a uh, few, few prayer requests. Um, and, and then we'll go to the Lord. So we mentioned on the prayer chain, and maybe you got this, a gentleman named John Leith, who was a part of our body for many, many years, um, had a heart attack this week. Um, they did surgery, but he, he didn't end up recovering on that. So he did pass away, um, would have been yesterday morning, I believe. Um, and, and so uh, pray, be praying for John's family and friends. John, if you didn't know John, he uh, had, had such a heart for evangelism. He was involved in prison ministry. He was involved in outreach on campus and, and just a really encouraging guy that way and and so be praying for the uh, those that loved him and the, and the family on that uh continue to pray for randy Slutes. um randy uh most recent concern has been an infection that that actually went all the way into his his bones in, in one particular area and they're afraid that it may need surgery uh they've been using antibiotics through an iv and they want to do that for six weeks and then if that's effective um There'll be uh, maybe a, a, a less, less major surgery. They'll have to do something more minor. And so pray for effectiveness there. It appears to be working, uh, though. And then uh, the last thing, so I won't mention them by name since we're putting this online, but some missionaries that we support in the Middle East. So if you've been here for a while, you probably know who, who, who that is. Uh, their country, they described it as in the midst of a perfect storm with uh, currency collapse, uh, banking and government like malpractice, social crisis, and then the, this pandemic. And so they've seen the currency drop by, or inflation of 70%. Um, they've seen massive unemployment. They're anticipating this country that had been pretty prosperous, likely by this time next year, 60% of the people being below the poverty line. Um, it's been very difficult. But in the midst of that, there's been some amazing opportunities uh, for the local church that they're a part of for outreach. And they've seen many come to Christ and the, the body itself strengthened. And so be praying for them, though, for, for ministry during this, what they call this perfect storm. Okay, I want to read from Psalm 67, and then we'll pray for these things. Psalm 67. God... Be gracious to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, that is our desire, because um, it's your desire, that the nations would be glad because they would know you. They, they would know their creator, their, their maker. Their, their people from all over the world, their wandering hearts would, would land on you. And they would see that you have met their greatest need, their need for forgiveness in Christ. And, and so we, we, we pray for that. We pray for uh, those from our body that have, that have gone out um, to, to other nations and taken the gospel there, in particular this family we mentioned that are serving in the Middle East and they're experiencing this, this perfect storm of conditions that has made life uh, very, very difficult for many in that country. And while we certainly desire that that would turn around um, and there'd be greater stability, we pray that in the, in the middle of the instability that your gospel would go forward and, and that the local church, as they band together and meet needs for one another and as they look outward, um, Lord, you would see real fruit come from this. I pray for Randy, um, Lord, for his healing and recovery from this infection that's worked its way into his bones. Um, we pray that the, uh, the antibiotics he's on would effectively treat that, um, sustain him. This has been such a long road, so we continue to pray for that. We 
uh, are saddened by the passing of John uh, Leith. Um, we rejoice that he's even now in your presence. Um, we rejoice over the many that he influenced for, for Christ. Um, uh, but we pray for those who, who love him and miss him, that you would comfort them. And Father, we ask now as we, as we look at your word, even as we just sang, Lord, would you show us Christ in your, in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can turn to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. In a few minutes, we will read this, um, verses 2 to 6. You know, it's natural in, in hardship to, to kind of turn inward more and to think about, you know, our problems, our pain, our worries, our suffering. It's kind of a normal response to hardship. And yet when we do that, we can end up closing ourselves off from significant open doors to, to love our neighbors. And the greatest way, of course, that we can love our neighbors is by giving them the greatest news, by giving them the, the gospel. Well, this passage is now going to, to turn to that. It's going to go to, to looking outward. And so if you've been with us as we've been off and on working through Colossians, you've seen in, in chapter 3, there, there had been an emphasis internally for a while on the, the one another passages and, and how for those who've trusted in Christ and have been given new life in Christ, how they should treat one another with some negatives, you know, not lying to one another and then some, some positives of bearing with and forgiving one another. And so that made up a lot of chapter three. It was like internal stuff. So how we treat each other in a body of Christ like this. Uh, and then it turns to relationships within the household so husbands and wives and, and parents and kids and masters and slaves because of this historical context there we looked at last week. Well, now it turns to those that are, that are, that are outside. It turns from kind of inside to, to those that are outside. And, and, and it urges us to, to look outward, not, not to look at people who don't know Christ as you know, mere, mere projects, um, but, but it teaches us and speaks about how we are to live wisely and winsomely and make the most of opportunities that we do have for, for outreach. And, and as, we, as we talk about, you know, passages like this that talks about evangelism or outreach or sharing Christ, whatever you want to call it, um, some common questions that people, believers, often think about with that is, you know, I, I, I get that, but like, how do I, how do I begin a conversation? What, what do I say to somebody? And we can end up getting kind of paralyzed not knowing what to say or to do. And we can end up with this kind of underlying sense of guilt. Like, I know I should be sharing the gospel more, but I, I don't know how, or I don't want to hurt my relationships with this person, or I, I just feel awkward. Well, this, this passage, I think actually, if you can resonate with any of those concerns, has some, some good news for you, because it has some good, good instruction for what really this perspective we can have as we look outward um, at, what, at what the Lord must do and what we can do. And so I'm going to read this now. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2, and look at verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up, us, uh, open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I, make, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. We're going to look at this really in, in, in two parts. And the first part is so simply to... Pray, and it starts with prayer. Pray, pray for open doors and a, and a clear message. Uh, evangelism ultimately begins with prayer uh, because there's things in the heart that, that only God can do. And, and so before we get to anything that we're supposed to say, we, we need to pray. And, and it says specifically here, and I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we go through this. It says to devote yourselves to prayer. Um, devote means to persist in, to stick with, to be diligent. As we read about the early church in the book of Acts, they, they're often described as being uh, devoted to prayer. The, the apostles are described that way. It says, we will devote ourselves to prayer. 
and to the ministry of the word. So kind of from the leadership side, this is, that's what we're, we're devoted to prayer. This is, this is kind of what we're responsible to do in, in the ministry of the word. But then the, the whole body is described that way. The body of believers uh, earlier in Acts, Acts 2.42, they, which in this context is all these believers there, says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, meaning to God's word, to, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and, and to prayer. So from the leadership down to just kind of everybody, they, they were described as being devoted to prayer, persisting in, sticking with prayer. Again, if we believe that there's a work in the heart that God must do in people, then we must pray. And so it says, devote yourself to prayer, and then it modifies it in two ways. It gives us two modifiers of this in verse 2. It says, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So keeping alert, and then this attitude of thanksgiving. What does it mean to, to keep alert? Look at that first. Maybe think about kind of what's the opposite of that. You know, so to keep alert would be not just like passively praying or kind of praying in vague ways or... Just, just kind of mindlessly running through stuff, but, but to, to watch around you, to watch for needs, and to, to pray specifically, and to, to watch to see how God would answer. What I think of with this is, like, am I, am I praying specifically enough that if God answered my prayer, that I would even notice, you know? Or is my prayer so vague, you know, God bless so-and-so, God, would you do this? But, but just in a really vague way, I wouldn't even really notice if he answered. So I think part of being alert or keeping alert is to, to be watchful and specific and, and aware of things to pray for. But I think another aspect of this, when we look at New Testament statements about being alert, it, many of the New Testament passages, about half of them that use this phrase of being alert have to do with living in light of Christ's certain and imminent return, meaning that he could return at any, at any moment, at any time. And, and so we see that in passages like Matthew 24, 42, where Jesus says, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day our Lord is coming. L living as if he could return at any time. Uh, that's part of being on the alert. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 2, and then skipping ahead to verse 6, it says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Uh, so, so part of it then just has to do with being aware that, okay, Jesus could return at any point or, or I could pass away and go be with him. And, and so if, if that could happen at any time and if every day is kind of this ticking of the clock as the clock ticks down to when he'll return, which could be soon, soon or it could be generations later. We, we don't know, but, but we're to live as if it could be any time. You know, how will that shape the way that I, that I pray or, or the way that I talk to people? Another way to kind of ask that of yourself is if you knew that today was your last day on earth, how, how would you spend it? What kind of conversations would you have with people? What would your perspective be? So part of being alert is to, to live with this eternal perspective in mind and with this idea that Jesus could return at any moment. If you remember, the, one of the guiding statements here in this second part of Colossians is at the beginning of chapter 3 where he says, set, set your mind on things above where Christ is. And, and, and it urges us not to merely live for this present moment, but, but to live for Christ. And so to keep alert in prayer, to be devoted to prayer is an, is an outflow of that. But it also says to do that with an attitude of thanksgiving. So devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. And this, is a re, this is the theme that is just repeated throughout Colossians. I, if I have it here on the PowerPoint, I don't. Um, so you just have to, to kind of listen there. Um, in, in Colossians, there's been at least five other times that, that has urged us to, to be thankful. So in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul models that. He says, we give thanks to God as we pray to you. Chapter 1, verse 12, talks about giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the saints of the light, or the inheritance of the saints in the light. In chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, each of those verses talks about either being thankful or singing with thankfulness or giving thanks through him to God the Father. So it's, it's been repeated, and now it comes up again. He says, as you're devoting yourself to prayer, man, be, be thankful. 
be thankful. And as we've talked about with some of these others, it's not because our circumstances are necessarily easy. As, as Paul's writing this, he's in jail, um, doesn't necessarily know when he's going to get out. And so his circumstances were hard, and yet he's giving thanks, and we're urged to give thanks. So devote yourselves to prayer, being alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. But what are we to pray for? And there's lots we could pray for, but this it gets pretty specific. Look, at, look again at verse 3. It says, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word. That there will be these open doors for the word so that we can speak forth. He says, pray, pray for open doors. And again, Paul's in prison, but he's not saying pray that the prison door will open. Pray that there will be open doors for ministry. And, and I think that could, to, to kind of go back to the introduction a little bit, shape, shape our perspective on evangelism, especially if you're one that, that tends to, to often kind of fear, fear, be fearful when it comes to talking to others about Christ or not quite sure what to say. It's a great way to just start praying. God, would you, would you open some doors here? But, but even that, what, is, what does that mean? Well, when we look at the book of Acts, we can see a, a scenario where they were praising God because he opened doors for ministry. And then if we look back and we see what, what did God do, then I think we can get a sense of what, what that phrase means. So in Acts 14, near the end of Acts 14, verse 27, after Paul's first missionary journey, the gathering back with the, their local church that sent them, and they're reporting on that, and it says, when they had arrived and gathered their church together, they began to report on all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So after what spans chapters 13 and 14 in the book of Acts, they, they get done with this ministry and they, they praise God for the way that he had opened a door. Well, well what, what does that look like? As you look back through chapters 13 and 14, and I'll just kind of skim through it here, you can, you can see he, his, this missionary journey took him through what's now modern-day Turkey, many cities there. And, and as they went through these cities, they, they had great opportunities that opened up for them. Not everywhere. In many places, it seems like doors were closed to them. But, but other places, they were able to go into the local synagogues. And they were able to talk to, to the Jewish people that had gathered there, but also other Gentiles who would come, non-Jewish people. And in uh, one city that was described, the city of Antioch, they, they shared on a Sabbath day. And then they were asked to come back again the next week. And they, they did again, and there was this huge turnout. And the people they really had in mind they were going to minister to, the Jewish people, many of them rejected the gospel. M many responded, but many rejected. But then many of these non-Jewish Gentiles came, and they, they were curious, and they, and they listened, and they, and they wanted to hear more, and, and they responded. And so in chapter 13, verse 48, it says, The Gentiles began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And then it goes on to describe how the, the word just continued to spread throughout this region. And so this open door, it appears to just be opportunities and responsiveness. Right? Opportunities and, and responsiveness. And, and so what a great thing for us to pray for. You know, Lord, would you, would you open up some doors this week for me to talk to people about Jesus would there be some opportunities and some responsiveness in the hearts of others? So, so recognizing that, that God needs to do some things there, but we can, we can ask. We can ask for open doors. And Paul, as he's writing to the Colossians, he's saying, hey, would you, would you pray this for me? And, and then he goes on to ask for something else that I'm actually really encouraged it's in here. Look, look, at, verse, look at verse 4. So, so pray for an open door, and then verse 4 that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul the Apostle, and he's saying, hey, pray that I could be clear. S sometimes we know that feeling of the message getting confused as it travels from our head to our mouths, right? I mean, how many times do you leave a certain situation and you think, oh, man, why did I say that? You know, what? that wasn't what I meant to say, or that was confusing, or I could see it in their eyes that they weren't tracking with it, and you know, maybe you get intimidated or fearful or flustered in certain situations, and I, I, I do, I do. And, and, and so this prayer that, 
He's saying, hey, pray for me. And it's something I think we can pray for ourselves is that we would be clear. So, so God, would you open some doors? And God, would you help me to be clear when I talk to people in these situations? We can, we can think about it. We can, we can practice as far as kind of being clear. Um, Proverbs 15, 28 talks about this. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. The mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. There's a real value in pondering how to answer, thinking about it. So we don't just pray and just you know, hope that God kind of puts the words in our mouths. We ponder, we think about how to answer and respond in situations, but we also pray. God, help me to be clear. Help me to be clear. Well, this passage moves from his requesting, pray this for me, and it shapes some good ways we should pray for ourselves and for, for each other, to, to some ways that he's telling the Colossians to conduct themselves that are also very applicable for us. We see that we are to conduct ourselves wisely and winsomely, still with an eye of, like, looking out, okay? So, so as you're looking out to those that are, have needs, praying for open doors, praying for clarity with the message, and, and now we're also trying to conduct ourselves in a way that's wise and that our words would be, full of grace and winsome. Where it says, conduct yourselves with wisdom. Wisdom is just simply, we often describe it as skillful living. And here the emphasis is on making the most of opportunities that we have. So we're praying for open doors, and then as there's opportunities that come, it says, you know, trying to make the most of those things, uh, not letting those go by, which is part of being alert, even as we pray and as we go about relationships. That, that doesn't mean that every relationship, every interaction, every immediate conversation, the only thing we're thinking about is like, how, how can I get to the gospel in this moment? Although I think it needs to be an important concern for us. Like, how can I, how can I talk to this person about Christ? That at least ought to be the desire in our minds, but it doesn't have to be the immediate goal in every conversation. I appreciated a friend several years ago who had a real heart for evangelism, and, and he would distinguish between what, what are our desires and our goals when it comes from interacting with people who don't know Christ. Of course, our desire is that they all come to know Christ, and our desire is that we have an opportunity to talk to them about Christ. But our goal, and if our goal in every conversation is to, to do that in every conversation, they can feel like a project. They can, they can, they can feel like we're not really loving and valuing them. And so he said, yes, that should be our desire, but our goal can be, well, to conduct ourselves wisely, uh, to, to let our speech be with grace. Our goal can be to, to, to love them and to conduct ourselves wisely in every interaction. And, and sometimes that means simply serving them and helping them, spending time together, enjoying our relationship. Sometimes that means asking questions. Sometimes it means walking through a very crystal clear presentation of the gospel. You can see why it says to conduct yourself with wisdom. Because you guys probably know that. Sometimes it's hard to know what to do in a particular situation. You, you, you care about this person you're talking to and you want them to know Christ, but where do, I, do I bring something up now? Do I not? Um, do, do I just spend time with them and show them love? Do, do I ask them questions? It, it takes wisdom on that. But what this tells us is we should, we should ask for that and we should seek to conduct ourselves with that kind of wisdom. Many times it, it won't be that, those particular words that we use, but, but ways that we're able to show them love that, that then opens the door for, for the gospel. Um, Think of a story from church history with uh, Augustine. It might be a name that you guys know. Augustine was a, one of the early kind of church, well, call them church fathers, kind of church you know, writers, pastors in the fourth century. Uh, and although he was raised with a Christian mother, he had wandered far from Christ, was not a believer through his teens and, and 20s, and, and lived a pretty wild life as he described it. But one of the things that God used to change him and to bring him to Christ was a man named Ambrose, uh, who was a, was a pastor, essentially. And uh, this is what he, he says of Ambrose. He says, he welcomed me with fatherly kindness and showed the charitable concern for my pilgr pilgrimage that befitted a bishop. I began to feel affection for him, not at first as a teacher of truth, but simply as a man who was kind to me. I thought that was interesting. So he says he was simply, he was kind to me. 
And, and then they went on and they had these great conversations and there was a, uh, an intellectual component to it. And don't, don't hear me saying like you just, just be nice to people, but, but that kindness is a key component. He says, he was simply kind to me. So it says we should conduct ourselves with wisdom and then our speech, verse six, is to always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. It uh, should be with, with grace, a, a gracious speech. Some similar language is communicated in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, meaning it builds them up according to the need of the moment. That's part of, again, being alert. What, what, is this, what does this person need in this moment? Do they just, just need a hug? Do they just need me to listen? Do they need me to ask questions? What do they need? What, what fits the need of this moment? so that it will give grace to, to those who hear. And so likewise here, it says we are to have our speech always be with grace. Proverbs uh, speaks of it in a slightly different way. It says, uh, Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Again, it's another one that urges us to think about what, is this, what does this person need right now? What is the need of this moment, the need of this circumstance? Well, I want to look through, through four maybe ways we can think about this, this, this speech, and what, what might be the wise speech in different, different settings. First, use questions effectively. Use questions effectively. This was often Jesus' strategy. When you read through the Gospels, you see him so often responding with a question. Even as they ask him a question, he often asks a question back. So, you think of Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. It says, as he was setting out on a journey, I've got this on here. Yeah, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Man, we pause there. Like, that's the question we want people to ask, right? That's like, that feels like a softball question. Like, man, this is the chance, like, gospel, full, full bore. Like they, he, and, and yet Jesus he asks him a question back. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He, 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 he probes a little bit. What do, you, what do you mean by good? Why would you call me good? He recognizes that he needs to, to get this guy thinking a little bit. Or later in chapter 22 of Matthew, people are trying to trap him with, do you pay taxes to Caesar or not? And it was kind of this internal debate. And he just, Showed them a coin and said, Who, whose likeness is on this? And he asked them a question. And, and so I, I think there's a model for us there. Uh, one man who did this really well uh, is a man who passed away this week, uh, Ravi Zacharias. And so some of you might be familiar with, with uh, that name. He was a, an author, a, a speaker. We call him an apologist because he helped people reason through the faith. And there's, a, there's this great scene I, I, I watched again this week where he, he's doing a, a Q&A at a college campus, so this big auditorium, and people were lined up asking questions, and one bright, uh, young, appeared to be kind of like a philosophy student type guy, asked him this really long question about subjective moral reasoning. You know, why, why are you so afraid, he, he's asking Ravi, about subjective moral reasoning? You know, do you think people are going to be bad if we don't have this book telling us what's right and wrong? And he this long, kind of philosophically loaded question about kind of the nature of right and wrong and why do we need a God to tell us what's right and wrong and he got done and, and Ravi just walked up and he said, do you lock your doors at night? Uh, this is a question back. He said, do you lock your doors at night? And, and everybody laughed, including the questioner, you know, kind of disarmed him and, and then he, he kind of got him thinking there. He, he worked into that and helped him to see that that there is moral truth in this universe that God has made. And, and we recognize that people break it, which is why we lock our doors at night, because we know this world is a dangerous place. And that's why we have police, and that's why we have laws and jails. And, and he used that to very tactfully then get into the, the need for there to be a, a moral law giver that right and wrong stands on. And he used questions. And so I want to encourage you, if, if God gives an open door to talk to somebody, it, rather than first thinking, what can I say? Maybe thinking, what can, I, what can I ask? What kind of question can I ask right now that might prompt their thinking a little bit? 
So use questions effectively. A uh, good book on that, by the way, is a book called Questioning Evangelism by Randy Newman. And that's what it's about. It's about how to ask good questions um, when you're sharing the gospel with people. Questioning evangelism. Uh, second, affirm what can be affirmed in their positions. As we're thinking about how can our speech be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, rather than just being so quick to always just counter what's wrong, counter what's wrong, I think, okay, is there, is there something I can affirm in what this person is saying? You know, so maybe they're bringing up, ah, I just think Christians are really judgmental and um, arrogant. You might ask a question and say, man, what? Has that been in your experience? Like, what makes you kind of feel that way? Or, you know, that'd be like a question you could ask. But a way you could affirm them is say, you know, sometimes probably right. Like, I know I'm, I'm kind of like that sometimes, too quick to judge others. Maybe there's something you can affirm. Not, not in a way that's manipulative, but just in a way that, that recognizes that you're, you're listening to them and you, you, you care about them as an individual. So ask, ask good questions. Uh, affirm if there are things that can be affirmed. I'm not saying to affirm things that are wrong, but if there's things that are true in what they're saying, look, look for ways to affirm that. Build on what they already know to be true. As we're thinking, how can my speech be Full of grace and seasoned with salt, meaning winsome and, and, and appealing. Well, part of it, build on what they already know to be true. They, they already likely care about justice, at least if it's them that's being treated unfairly. You know, they, they have a concept of justice. They, they, they know there's some sense of right and wrong. They, they maybe wonder what life is about. They, they know they can't consistently do the right thing. There's presuppositions that people might not even realize that they're holding on to that, that we can build on and, and, and help them to, to, to see that there's this conscience built within them that God has given them. Build on what people already know to be true. And, and yet, don't be surprised if in the end people reject the message and maybe you too. You can do all the, the right things. You can be gracious and wisdom and conducting yourself wisely and yet people can still say no and, and get upset and when we're really clear on the gospel that, that may occur and yet don't be shocked by that. Jesus himself said to expect this, blessed are you and men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Notice it's for the sake of the Son of Man, not just because you were just kind of being a jerk. You know, it's not, it's not that. But it says sometimes people, because of Christ, will, will reject you. And we need to be willing to, to live with that. A little bit later in Luke, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless, uh, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. It's, it's assuming there'll be enemies, there'll be people who don't like us, there'll be people who curse us. But it says, love them, pray for them, but don't be surprised at that. Or in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. So we want to be wise and gracious. We want to pray for opportunities. We want to have our eyes open to see them. Ask good questions. Affirm when we can. Be a good listener. Pray that God would help us to be clear. Look for ways to be clear, but know that sometimes they'll be people who still just reject. And it's because there's work in the heart that God must do there. Well, I want to wrap up. I want to just wrap up with this, though, kind of last point. It's maybe just it's kind of for you to think about. Or like if you're, if you're watching, I know we have people recording this one, might be, be watching this later. Uh, thinking about, are, are, are you... Where, where are you here? He's describing some that are, that are outside. He says, make, make the most of these opportunities. Um, conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders. Assuming that there's those that are outside and those that are, that are inside. Outside of what? And, and how do you get inside? Um, he uses some similar language in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. A little different context, but some similar language. It says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? He's talking about sin within the local church and, and needing to deal with that. He says, well, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you, do you not judge those who are within the church? So he's, he's contrasting those who are outsiders with those who are within the church. And it doesn't just mean that they gather in a, in a building, but that they have 
join themselves to the, to the body of Christ because they've responded to Christ. So being outside or inside has it's nothing to do with ethnicity or being born into the right family or good behavior or being worthy or unworthy or do you go to church or do you not? It essentially just comes down to what, what will you do with Jesus? What, what have you done with Jesus? I say that because of some ways that Jesus describes this. In John chapter 1, verses 11 to 12, I'm talking about Christ. It says, He came to His own. Those who were His own did not receive Him. They, they did not believe that He was who He says He was. That He came as the God and man to, to die for sin, live a perfect life, die for sin. They, they did not believe that. They did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. That's what it means to be inside, not outside, but inside, to be a child of God, those who've received him, those who've believed in his name, those that say, God, you're right, I've messed up my life. I have rebelled against you. I have I've not lived in a way that I know is right. I've sinned, and I'm, I, I, I believe that Jesus came and he died in my place, and I'm receiving him. I'm turning. I'm trusting in Christ. That's, that's what it is to respond to the gospel, that's what it is to be then inside and not, and not outside. So it doesn't matter if your parents are Christians and they bring you to, Sunday, or to, to church every Sunday or to, to your couch every Sunday, but have you personally trusted in Christ? Uh, that's, so we become inside and not, and not outside. Let's, uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Uh, Lord, we um, desire to see all people come to know Christ um, as we've come to know Christ. And so we, we pray. We pray for open doors, meaning we pray for opportunities and we pray for responsive hearts. We pray for clarity as we often kind of muddy up the, the message. We pray for clarity we pray, help us to conduct ourselves wisely, um, making the most of opportunities that you give us. And Lord, I, I pray first, really first in terms of priority, that, that, that each of us would know for sure that we're, we're inside and not outside, that, that we have responded to your kind offer in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, as we sing our last song here. At least some of the worship team will come back up. I'm not sure who all is participating in this last one, but they'll come on up. Um, I mentioned this last week, but we're not, we're not passing an offering plate because of you know, trying to minimize the way we're handing things back and forth. Uh, but, but if you, you know, would like to give those an offering box in the back on your way out, you can drop it in there. So, Okay, I'll turn it over to you guys. Would you stand, please? This life is an altar where I want to offer my soul, my mind, and strength. I'm cleansed by your mercy to live a life worthy of the one who called An offering. 
you. You are to our rescue. Raise me up from death to life. Spirit is in me. Revealing your glory. Oh, what joy is I give. As we wrap up here, just uh, like we did last week, if you were here last week, we want to ask people not to remain in here, but to, 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 to move out so they can start cleaning in here. It's probably not as urgent that you go all the way outside, since it's just not as big of a group here tonight. So if you want to visit with people in the lobby a little bit, I think there's room for that. Um, just kind of keep, keep distance. Uh, but we do want to move out of here so that the cleaning people can start, can start in, in here. So, Okay, um, Brad, can you close us in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the grace that you have given us in Christ, uh, the one who has paid for our sins by his death, uh, who rose again to new life. It gives us hope as we join in the resurrection and we're raised to new life through faith in Christ. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for your abundant mercy, your goodness, and your constant faithfulness to us. God, I pray as we go out from here that we would be those who live with purpose and intention to reach our, our neighbors, uh, the world for Christ. Uh, help us to be clear. Help us to speak with clarity. Um, help us to be wise in our interactions with others. Uh, I pray that you would, Lord, open up doors, opportunities, uh, and uh, that you would work uh, within the hearts of those that we uh, talk to as we take advantage of those opportunities. I pray that there would be responsiveness. Help us to love others well, I, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.